All right, I have started the recording, so I'm gonna get going. Thank you guys very much for coming to my presentation, uh, The Suffragette in My Family. And what I am excited about today is that this is the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote in the United States. And so what I've done for my presentation today is given a historical perspective of women's right to vote in the United States. It focuses a lot on Montana, and that is because that is where my great-great-grandmother, Mary Long Alderson, lived and turns out was a suffragette. Um, there are various things that talk about whether we should use the term suffragette or suffragist. And so it is correct to refer to her as a suffragette because she was a lobbyist and activist with regard to women's right to vote. Um, a suffragette supported uh, people giving women the right to vote. It could be a man or a woman, um, but the suffragette itself was someone who was actively advocating. So we'll start out with my great grandmother, great great grandmother, Mary Long Alderson. Uh, so this is a photo of her that uh, my brother-in-law or cousin brother-in-law had uploaded onto Ancestry.com, which is what got me interested in uh, Mary Alderson. Um, I, like a lot of people, did uh, Ancestry.com and doing different family research and uh, learning about different people in my family, and it was when I was doing that, that I found out that my great-great-grandmother had been a, a big mover and shaker in Montana and also on the national front for getting women the right to vote. Um, but not necessarily the one that you hear a lot about when you look at the history, and I'll explain why that is as well. So my hope had been that when I was doing this that I'd be able to go back and look at family photos and albums and sketchbooks um, I have family in Oregon that have a lot of her old photos, family in uh, California that have notes from her, and then, um, you know, she's from Montana, and even the Montana State University has a special collection dedicated to the Alderson family, and I'd hoped I'd be able to go there. Uh, but with COVID, I wasn't able to do that research that I hoped. And so I ended up doing this differently than I expected, but I think in a way that was really also interesting and insightful, which is I had to do a Google search. And that was when I found out I could actually do a Google search on my great-great-grandmother because she even has a Wikipedia page. I had no idea. So um, what I've done here is I did my research the way that someone would have to do if they weren't part of the family of Mary Long Alderson. And I've learned a lot about her and I've given as many accounts that I can uh, from biographies, but also um, able to look at it with a little bit more, I guess, of a family eye. So she was born June 19th, 1860. And so the first thing I thought would be is so what was going on in 1860? Tell me, tell me where I am in history. So on April 3rd, 1860 is when the Pony Express began. June 19th, 1860, she was born Mary Elizabeth Long. On November 6th, 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president. December 30th, the states began to secede from the Union and the following year, the Civil War begins. So that is what's going on as Mary is born. So, I was kind of going, okay, this is all major things, and, and I got to look at this, and I went, but wait a minute, that's her childhood. So um, I'm going to talk about that childhood because I think it sets that foundation for her and who she is, um, but then we're going to talk a lot more about uh, her as an adult. So she is my great-great-grandmother, uh, Mary, her youngest daughter, Priscilla, I had her oldest daughter, Margaret, who was my grandmother, and then Margaret's second oldest child and oldest son, Tim, is my dad. Mary's childhood, we, we're gonna 
1860 to 1880. Uh, Mary was a Massachusetts native. Uh, she was born in Weymouth, Massachusetts. I learned that that is the second oldest town in Massachusetts. And um, many years before Mary was born, it was actually the home of Abigail Smith, the wife of John Adams, the second president of the United States. So where she was born obviously is a place that has historical significance for the United States. And it is also a, a town that was already very well established, a, already over 100 years old um, when she was born. I mean, a huge amount of history there prior to her being born. Um, but then she was also part of an important part of history occurring at that time, uh, which is because she was the child of Irish immigrants. Her parents were Eliza Reagan and John Long. Um, I learned they were both born in Cork, Ireland, and that they had immigrated to the United States in Boston in 1851. So I, I did some research and said, okay, so why, why, why did they come? And it, it's most likely it is because of the Great Hunger or the Great Potato Famine. Um, as I looked at the research, uh, you know, that would be exactly the time that people would be leaving. Um, the crops didn't recover in Ireland until really 1852. So the timing is right uh, for that being the reason that they left Ireland. Um, and during that time, it's estimated a million people in Ireland perished and a million people emigrated from Ireland. So one of the things that I find interesting about the fact that she's the child of Irish immigrants um, is that my name, Megan, my middle name was Sheila. And so uh, being Megan Sheila, I would often have people comment that, uh, oh, Megan Sheila, you must be Irish. And um, I, I said, no, I'm, I'm not Irish at all. It's pure coincidence. My parents just like the names. And my parents told me we weren't Irish. And it, and it turns out that my grandmother, Margaret, um, she had always told everybody, no, we're not Irish. And the reason she did that is because her mother told her that they were not Irish and her mother told her. So it really comes down to uh, Mary was very insistent that they were not Irish. And um, that persisted for many generations that we believed that we were not Irish at all. And it is very likely that that was because of the violence and discrimination against the Irish during um, Mary's childhood. Uh, and you'll see that she, she did move to Montana from Massachusetts. And um, it, it seems very likely that at that time she decided that she was going to uh, denounce being Irish in hopes of not having that uh, held against her. Um, I also thought it was interesting as I was looking at the Weymouth, Massachusetts, that in fact, that Weymouth claims today to have the highest population of Irish ancestry in the country. According to the last census, about 39% of the city reported in Irish ancestry. And in 2019, they had their first annual Irish Heritage Festival. So um, I think it's safe to say that uh, if she were here today, she would probably not feel the need to say she was not Irish. Um, but the document over here is also John Long's declaration uh, of his intent to become a U.S. citizen and, and denounce his Irish and English allegiances. Mary was an educated woman. Uh, she became a teacher in Massachusetts. And at the age of 27, she had resigned herself to being a spinster. And that was until she met uh, Matthew Alderson. Matthew Alderson traveled from Montana to Boston. I don't know why, but he came to Boston. Uh, he had been married. His first wife had passed away, and he met Mary Alderson. Um, the historical biographical accounts say it was love at first sight, and so uh, they were married in, uh, or I believe it was September of 1888. At that time, uh, Boston actually had a massive blizzard in December of 1888. So it's not clear if they left right away, um, but if they did not leave right away, um, most likely they, they stayed on in Boston until 1889, uh, which is also um, when Mary's father passed away. 
Uh, but at that point, uh, she was headed back out to, or headed out to Montana with her new husband and uh, became a settler in Montana. So I found this picture, which I, I loved. Uh, uh, Mrs. Matthew W. Alderson was taken in 1889. According to the historical notes, this photograph was taken by Matthew Alderson, and it is at Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so this has to be early on in their marriage uh, as she's getting to explore new parts of our, our country. So they ended up, the, and it's possible this was on their way to Bozeman, don't know. Uh, it was taken in Wyoming according to the notes. Um, but where they were moving was to Bozeman. Uh, Bozeman, Montana was founded in 1864 and incorporated in 1883. So um, it, it was a very, very new city. It was the county seat of Gallatin County. And the first newspaper was published in 1871 there and that was the Avant Courier. And the Aldersons were an important part of Bozeman. Uh, Matthew Alderson is the son of William Alderson. He was one of the earliest pioneers in Gallon Valley in Montana, homesteaded right near Bozeman. And uh, the historical information I found, he was also the local preacher. He performed the first wedding in Bozeman. And he and his sons were the owner of the Bozeman Avant Courier, that first newspaper in Bozeman. Um, so they had a, a major, major role to play in Bozeman, Montana. Um, they were a well-respected family. And so as Mary came there, uh, she had a lot of opportunities um, due to this family that she was able to uh, continue, as you'll see, with a lot of different um, a lot of different causes that she cared about in Montana. Uh, her husband, Matthew, ran mines in Montana, um, actually ran a number of different mining operations, including uh, some down in South America in the early 1900s. And there are a lot of passenger records of him uh, heading to South America um, around 1915. So the Avant Courier, the newspaper that the Aldersons owned, um, it was published in Bozeman. It became the uh, Bozeman Daily uh, Chronicle, according to the records I found. Um, and according to the biographical information I found, Mary Alderson uh, took on writing as a job and quickly established herself as a respected journalist. So she was among the few female members of the Montana Press Association and often wrote about women's issues and encouraged women among the newspaper's readership to become progressive. I read a lot of newspapers from Bozeman, including the Avant Courier. Uh, in doing this research, I couldn't find anything which uh, gave uh, gave nod to Alderson having written it, Mrs. Alderson having written it. Um, and the Avant Courier itself, at least the dates I could find, um, actually uh, didn't exist in 1889. Uh, it had ended earlier on, I think it was 1887. So I'm not, I couldn't verify this biographical information, um, but it was, it was said many, many places. Uh, that she was a reporter and obviously said she was a member of the Montana Press Association. So I think that information is out there. It just wasn't something I was able to find a lot of examples of. One of the other causes that Mary Alderson cared a great deal about was the rational dress movement. Uh, so uh, she's credited with having said, until a woman is allowed to have ankles, there is no hope for her brains. And uh, the rational dress movement, she was a strong advocate of women not having to wear corsets and of them being able to have their skirts five inches higher so that they could walk. And that's the not allowed to have ankles. So she felt that the movement on the rational dress front would also uh, help women be able to uh, convince the public that we could also use our brains and vote. Uh, in 1934, she wrote a history of Montana women's suffrage, and I thought it was just a, a very, um, very interesting to read what she wrote. 
Uh, in Montana, woman has been absolutely freed from the legal boundary imposed on her for centuries by the common law. The rational dress movement has dramatized in women's clothes, the freedom for which she was struggling, and women today may wear anything they wish. It has been the dream of girls through the ages to be boys and do the things boys do. Nothing hinders them today. Yes, any girl at the present time may do anything any boy may do, and they wear a velvet chain or trousers. She is free. And so I, I, I really enjoyed this. This is something that, that she wrote uh, in this historical account. And it also makes me smile because one of the things that my grandmother often would tell me about her childhood was that she had a very strong connection with her grandma and uh, that it was always really difficult because my, my grandma self-described that she always wanted to do the things that boys did. And so as I read this quote, um, I started to see more of a picture of how that relationship grew and, and why it was so special. Um, my, my grandma was born in 1925. So I think perhaps some of, of her influence is also in that writing uh, from her grandma um, at that time. So women's right to vote, when did that happen? Well, Mary went with her family to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. And the Chicago World's Fair uh, had the Women's Hall, which is what's pictured here, and there was a women's convention with many speakers. And the biographies say that when Mary heard Susan B. Anthony speak at that World's Fair, that that was a turning point for her, that she felt that women's suffrage was a cause that she needed to be part of. It was by no means the beginning of women's suffrage. Uh, women's voting rights in America was an issue that had persisted for years, decades, um, but that was when she first uh, became passionate about that cause. So a little bit of historical context. 1787, the U.S. Constitutional Convention decided that states would decide if women could vote. So at this time, many of the um, colonies uh, did actually grant women certain rights to vote. Uh, but with this decision at the U.S. Constitutional Convention, um, at that point, New Jersey was the only state that continued to allow women to vote. So women lost quite a bit of voting rights with the U.S. Constitution being enacted. And then in 1808, I believe it was, uh, might, might have been earlier than that, but I think it was 1808, New Jersey actually uh, did away with women's rights to vote as well. So um, you've got that historical context. And then uh, we move up to 1848 is when the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls was held. So that's when Susan B. Anthony starts becoming uh, very well known for her advocacy of um, women's rights to vote. And you can see that still 12 years before Mary's even born. In 1870, uh, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution was enacted. It prohibited denying the right to vote due to race, but not due to gender. Uh, this was viewed as a setback for women's suffrage advocates at the time. They had thought this was the perfect opportunity for this to be part of the Constitution. It was um, specifically not included. And so they, they, the women who were advocating for women's right to vote started going out to the states and doing independent advocacy in each state, trying to get the states, okay, well, we'll go one at a time to get women the right to vote. I, I believe it was 1870 that Washington State had allowed uh, women the right to vote and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that that was unconstitutional. And so that particular case was the tipping point for women's suffrage that said the only way this is going to happen is if you get an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So uh, that was a really important uh, portion of that. And, you know, I didn't do a whole lot of historical research here, so I may have some of my, my timelines not quite accurate here, but this was the best I could come up with um, in what I was finding. So 
an important note is in 1889, Wyoming did have unrestricted voting rights for women and insisted that continued into statehood. Uh, but regardless, we were really not seeing um, that basically women's rights to vote were making any progress at most. They were staying still or moving backwards. So 1889, what was going on? 1889 is when Mary is moving to Montana with her husband. Uh, this is uh, important, po important things were happening, frankly, for women's rights to vote. Uh, we've got the Eiffel Tower opening. Charlie Chaplin was born. Adolf Hitler was born. Thomas Edison showed his first motion picture. The US population was 43 million. And this is also when, on November 8th, Montana became a state and November 11th, Washington became a state. So um, these important moments for these states are also important for women's rights to vote. Uh, the women's right to vote in Montana from 1889 to 1914, uh, it started in 1889 because that was when Montana was trying to become a state. They had their constitutional convention I believe it was July 4th through um, August 17th, but it was at July 17th uh, was when the um, Montana Constitutional Convention decided that they would not include women's right to vote uh, in their state constitution. And it was specifically noted that they believed that if they did include women's rights to vote, it might prevent them from becoming a state. Also, the Great Northern Railway was born uh, in, in Montana, that concept, the railways were, were being built, but that was when the, the concept of that railway from uh, Minneapolis, I believe, to Seattle was born. Montana became a state. And at this time, Montana was a leader in mining. They were mining copper, silver, and gold, um, also granite, uh, and for the most part, the, the, I want to say they peaked in 92, 1892 was the peak of Montana mining. That was when they were actually the largest miner uh, in the United States. Um, but at this point, they're like second to Colorado. So they're, they're bringing a lot of money, They've got a lot of billionaire, millionaires, excuse me, not billionaires, a lot of millionaires, a lot of mining going on, a lot of building, a lot of growth, and their population is at 142,000. So a little bit about that constitutional convention. Um, what happened was there, wh why July 17th was, was when that decision was made. Um, the Fergus County delegate, Perry McGaddo, uh, was the husband of a successful businesswoman and feminist, Clara McGaddo. And so she had championed the cause and he recruited a longtime Massachusetts suffrage proponent, Henry Blackwell, to address the convention. Uh, Blackwell was an articulate orator. Uh, he made an impassioned plea, um, but he failed. And he said that that was because he did not have the backing of a well-organized grassroots movement. And is quoted as saying, there has never been a women's suffrage meeting held in Montana. Well, he didn't have to, to wait long. Basically, after 1889, uh, was when we start to see that women's suffrage grassroots movement really happening in Montana. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of where we go on this. So 25 years uh, until women get the right to vote in Montana. And Mary was there for, for quite a bit of that. So, uh, you know, she moves in 1889, 1890. Her first daughter, Myrtle, is born. Her second daughter, Dorothy, was born in 1891. And then that 1893 is when she attends that women's convention at Chicago World's Fair. So about four years in is when she decides she's gonna become part of that cause. Um, she did so pretty quickly. There was one stop along the way, which I thought was really interesting as well. So she uh, campaigned for the adoption of Bitterroot as the state flower of Montana. And, um, she is credited with being the reason that is the state flower of Montana, all of her advocacy and lobbying. So in 1895, she joined the Montana Women's Suffrage Association, and she attended the state convention. Um, in 1896, she decides to join the Bozeman Women Christian Temperance Union. And what I found in my research is um, there's the Montana Women's Suffrage Association, there's the National Women's Suffrage Association, 
and then the Women Christian Temperance Union, which advocates alongside the Women's Suffrage Association um, co continually uh, through passage of that 19th Amendment. So the WCTU was actually a huge moving force in getting um, women's right to vote passed. And, and generally speaking, when you look at the history, Women's Suffrage Association did a lot of um, a lot of the protests, a lot of the the rallies, um, a lot of the, the the parades to try to influence. The Women's Chem Christian Temperance Union did a lot of articles, a lot of writing, and a lot of neighborhood campaigns. So um, that it ends up being that's a big part of her getting into that suffrage suffrage movement. So 1898, uh, her third daughter Priscilla is born, so that's my great-grandmother, and then Mary really gets involved with this. Uh, she attends the Montana State Women's Kem Christian Temperance Union Convention. In 1900, she is the speaker at that convention, and she is elected recording secretary. She holds positions with the WCTU basically for 35 years after that. Uh, she is the recording secretary for most of the rest of the time until women get the right to vote. And with that I means she was in charge of keeping all their records. And I even went through and looked at their, their meeting notes for each of their conventions. And it was kind of amusing. Um, one year, she, she, early on, she didn't come to, to one of the conventions. And uh, they put somebody else in charge of being the recording secretary and elected her and the next year it says that that person had left the state and they all decided to make Mary the recording secretary and after that even when she missed the convention they still made her the recording secretary so uh, she must have done a very good job at this so in 1902 and I'll go into this a little bit more she helped Susan B Anthony in writing uh, the history of women's suffrage and she she's credited with writing the Montana chapter and she is the assistant editor of the WCTU monthly paper. And uh, she's then selected in 1910 to attend the National Convention for Women's Suffrage in uh, Baltimore. And in 1911, uh, she is uh, somebody selected to stand next to uh, Miss Rankin when she gives her congressional speech in uh, Montana. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So she had some, she, she was right there with a lot of the stuff that was going on in this movement uh, and uh, keeping a pretty good record of what was happening. The women's suffrage movement in Montana was pretty active. Um, they, Montana state legislator voted on equal suffrage during almost every session between 1895 and 1911. Uh, so that just tells you that those those women and men who were suffragists who were pushing this, um, they managed to get the ear of enough members of Montana Congress to put this in front of them every year. It passed in the House some years, not every year, but never in the Senate. Uh, so they they weren't able to get the momentum they needed at that time, uh, but it was there in almost every session. Uh, so Mary, what she was doing this time, here is uh, an excerpt from that WCTU voice, the, pu the monthly publication uh, shows Mary is an associate editor of that, uh, as well as being that recording secretary uh, listed there. In 1910, when she attends that uh, conference in Baltimore, and I, I, I wasn't sure if it was the WCTU or the National Suffrage Association. I saw different mentions in different places, um, but I wasn't able to get any historical information on which conference it was, but it was the National Conference. And what I did find out was while she was there, she met Louisa May Alcott uh, in her, her personal journals uh, that are on um, part of the special collection in the Washington or the Montana uh, State University Library. Uh, she talks about having met Louisa May Alcott and how special that was to her. I thought that was a, a nice piece of history to learn about. Um, 1911. So this is a really important moment. Rankin is, uh, Rankin was born in Montana 
She did advocacy, as many of you know, in the state of Washington, as well as New York and California, uh, in support of women's suffrage. Uh, in 1910, she was uh, helpful in getting uh, women's right to vote in Washington. And after that success, she then returned to Montana uh, to help with the cause of getting women the right to vote in Montana. So in 1911, she addressed Wyoming or Montana State Congress and urged support of women's suffrage. Um, there were three women who stood with, me, with her while she made the speech. And there was two physicians, two female physicians, and then Mary Long Alderson was the other person. This speech is considered by many a turning point for women's suffrage in Montana. However, I'm not sure that Mary Alderson thought so. Uh, she wrote regarding this speech, they gave her the violets, but not the votes we desired. So I don't think she was satisfied with the outcome there, uh, but she was, she was part of that. And, um, after that, after that 1911 session, the, the movements, the suffrage movement in Montana did something very creative. They convinced both the Democratic and the Republican parties to each put equal suffrage into their platforms. So during those 1912 campaigns for all of the Montana state legislators, both sides were saying, we're going to get equal suffrage passed. So in 1913, that's what they did. In January 1913, they passed the bill by large majorities, 26 to 2 in the Senate and 74 to 2 in the House, because they had convinced both sides that this was their issue. So um, all that was left was for the popular vote to approve this amendment to the Montana State Constitution. And that was the next thing that needed to happen. And so what the, what the suffragettes did was they started campaigning. They started campaigning locally. And this is where you see that WCTU. Uh, they had over 1,500 members and 50 chapters in Montana at that time. And they ran their own campaign in support of uh, women's right to vote and getting Montana to approve that constitutional amendment. The state president at that time, Mary Alderson Long of Bozeman, traveled 4,500 miles and effectively mobilized her members to engage in neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor campaigns. Some of the campaign methods that were used, according to Mary and her history of women's suffrage in Montana, there were meetings, parades, headquarters, distribution of literature and speakers. They raised money, arranged speakers, wrote pamphlets. And it was the Women's Christian Temperance Unit. They believed that prohibition and women's right to vote were hand in hand. And so Mary Alderson did say there was little opposition but much quiet work by the liquor interests. So uh, she, she still felt there was a battle being fought. I mean, you can see over here uh, to the side some of the, some of the maps that were used in the pamphlets uh, that were distributed to, to local communities. And uh, the, another thing that was done was a lot of advertisements. They uh, had a newspaper, the Suffrage Daily News, and they would have articles, and I, I did find a lot of these, and they're, they're really fun to read these, um, these old newspapers that are just entirely filled with persuasive writings on why women should have the right to vote. And included in that was this advertisement uh, that women's suffrage, the only constitutional amendment to be voted on November 3rd, be, vote yes because taxation without representation is tyranny. All governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, the home demands it, and the worker needs it. And so uh, these are some of the ways that they did uh, persuade the people of Montana to approve women's right to vote in Montana. Um, and pictured here is, this isn't actually when Montana, Montana did it, but um, this is the, the suffrage flag, and they would add a star for every state as um, they were moving towards the right to vote. So just kind of a fun, 
fun part. Um, but what, what Mary wrote in her historical account of Montana approving women's right to vote was, the long struggle of over 70 years for the political emancipation of women to which Susan B. Anthony and other women and men had practically devoted their lives to educate people to the justice of giving women the ballot was over for the state. I was obviously very happy with, with the outcome. Which meant that once Montana had approved it, they moved on to the national stage. Uh, much like other states, when uh, women's right to vote was approved, they moved to the national and said, how are we going to get this uh, for the nation? And uh, Montana was part of that as well. In 1916, Montana elected the first woman elected to Congress. That was Miss Jeanette Rankin from Montana. And pictured here is her first address to, um, to Congress after she was elected. Uh, and I thought this was, this was kind of interesting and fun. Um, it wasn't just advocacy in Congress. Uh, there were actually a lot of protests that were held. And uh, this is a photograph from the War Department of suffragettes bonfire and posters at the White House in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1917. Um, there was another photo, it wasn't, didn't come out quite as well, so I didn't include it, but it's a group of regular Americans protesting outside of the White House. So uh, there's a long history of, of those protests to express the desire to see changes in our government. So the, what happened, the 19th Amendment, it was approved by the House in May, of 1919. Montana ratified that in August of 1919. And, uh, it, but what was needed in order for it to actually become uh, approved and ratified to amend the Constitution was three-fourths approval. And that brings us to today and why today is such a special day. So on August 18, 1920, uh, Tennessee ratified that amendment and that was the 36 ratification and so that was our three-fourths approval necessary to ratify the 19th amendment but what i learned that i thought was interesting so it's credited as being the result of a change of vote by a 24 year old legislator harry byrne at the insistence of his elderly mother but those against the amendment managed to delay official ratification anti-suffrage legislators fled the state to avoid a quorum their associates held massive anti-suffrage rallies and attempted to convince pro-suffrage legislators to oppose ratification. And so even though the votes had been cast on August 18th of 1920, it wasn't until the 24th day of August that the governor ratified or certified those election results that the 19th Amendment had been approved. So the, what I learned is my great-great-grandmother did a lot to help preserve this history. Um, and I think that that is what I was able to find the most evidence of, although there are certainly a lot of biographies that say that she did a lot more than she gave herself credit for. But what I could find, what she did do, and the reason I could find it is because of her, was compilations. That history of women's suffrage with, by Susan B. Anthony four volumes and volume four chapter l titled montana the footnote says the history is indebted for this chapter to mrs mary long alderson of helena one of the first officers of the state women's suffrage association and uh, then i was able to find this letter dated december 25th 1902 it's from Susan B. Anthony, dear, my dear Mrs. Alderson, in recognition for your very kind and efficient assistance in the preparation of volume four of the history of women's suffrage, I take pleasure in presenting it to you. Affectionately yours, Susan B. Anthony. And there's a second letter uh, that came the following year on March 10th, 1903, which partially partially just interesting i'm sending my dear friend i'm sending you by express today the long promised copy of volume four of the history of women's suffrage the delay was caused by a fire in the bindery department of the publishers so apparently the book did not come with that first letter um, however something i thought that 
uh, was particularly special and especially for this group is the letter then says, I trust the book will reach you safely and you will derive as much pleasure from the study of its contents as I do in presenting it to you and that you will use every possible effort to have a copy of it placed in your public library. With best wishes for you always, I am sincerely yours, Susan B. Anthony. In addition to helping with this, later on, um, Mary wrote the historical sketch of the Montana Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, and, it, and you see in it at the beginning, um, it says, for many years, it's been the hope of our Montana Women's Christian Temperance Union that information in regard to its meetings and its various efforts and achievements might be gathered and recorded in brief form so that some authentic record of the organization might be available for members, schools, libraries, and general readers. And this is a book that I was able to get um, on a digital form and read through and was able, that's where I was able to see the history of her involvement as the recording secretary and the decision to send her to the national conventions. And so it was, it was a useful historical record that, that I utilized in doing my research as well. And I'm very grateful for her having uh, authored that with uh, Reverend, Reverend Hogue. She also has a lot of unpublished works and they are at the Montana State University Library, um, but she wrote the Montana laws relating to temperance and public morals, 34 years in the Montana Women's Christian Temperance Union, 1896 to 1920, the Montana State Floral Emblem Campaign of 1894, and she compiled a press clipping scrapbook as well. Um, so she's done a lot to preserve that history, um, and those are still resources that are cited in so many of the things that I was reading about Montana history. The very first thing they cite are the writings of Mary Alderson. So I also just wanted to include a little bit about that Montana State flower um, that the WCTU had adopted the Bitterroot as its flower in 1891. They sent it with Alderson as Montana's representative to the World Columbian Expedition, and she came home determined to have the state flower. So that's where she formed that Montana State Floral Emblem Society and single-handedly formed committees on the county and community level. Um, there was a statewide election for the state flower. And uh, she used the newspapers listing the virtues of the favorite flower. Um, and then they, they had the legislator adopted the bill and, and the state flower was adopted. And it, it is credited with being thanks to Mary Alderson. And so in closing, um, she did pass away January 7th, 1940. And uh, her obituary stated that she was a prominent state feminist and perhaps Montana's foremost woman lobbyist at the state capitol for more than 20 years. And that I wanted to include because that's one of the only mentions of her lobbying at the state capitol for more than 20 years. And I believe that's part of the reason that, you know, I don't, don't have a lot of pictures of her. I don't have a lot of, of documents of her out rallying the crowds because she was at the state capitol and she was lobbying the leg legislators to get, get changes made. And if you wanna learn more, the Washington State Historical Society is doing a centennial celebration and they're doing whistle stops and their final stop is going to be in Olympia on August 26th. And you can learn more about the suffragettes and the suffragist movement. <laughs>